Okay, welcome to the last uh, lecture for ES300. Um, today we're going to talk about socioeconomic implications um, of dealing with climate change. So uh, quasi-final exam questions for today. Why does swift action on greenhouse gas emissions likely entail higher costs, at least in the short term? Why are the trade-offs between uh, present and future impacts difficult to manage? And what other considerations are important in dealing with climate change in a socially responsible manner? Um, so a lot of this discussion um, sort of links back with one of the very first things we did in this class, which was read a uh, sort of an editorial from the New York Times. It was about the historical relationship between economic growth and social conditions. And the argument was made that economic growth is really important for having society that is essentially non-medieval. Uh, and the point of the article as well was to make this or to acknowledge the current link, at least between economic growth and CO2 emissions in modern society. Uh, and so the questions it was sort of posing uh, were along the lines of, can we meet climate or other environmental objectives without sacrificing environmental growth? Or is it a zero sum game? If it is a zero, zero sum game, are we willing to fall short uh, of these environmental goals in order to maintain um, economic growth uh, and is economic growth necessary to achieve social equality? So those are some pretty heavy questions that I think we could all sort of tie in within this theme of sustainable development, right? Um, it's not simple, right? Solving uh, climate change uh, does not just mean mitigating CO2 emissions, right? If we wanna have sustainable societies, part of that means uh, having environmentally sustainable societies. It also means we need uh, economically sustainable uh, societies and also socially sustainable societies. Um, so in essence, what we're really wanting is to have our cake and eat it too. We want to decouple um, the economy and carbon emissions, right? We want economic growth to remain steady or increase while global carbon emissions decline. Uh, now, traditionally, the thought has been that the trade-off um, between economic growth and emissions is more stark in developing or industrial or pre-industrial economies, right? And so this has to do with the environmental Kuznets curve, right? So on the x-axis, we hear, here we have stage of economic development or income per capita. Uh, and on the y-axis, some measure of environmental de degradation or pollution, which we're going to substitute in here for CO2 emissions. So if you are a pre-industrial economy, you gain wealth, and in, in other words, you move to the right as a function of moving uh, up, uh, which means that your economic development comes directly at the expense of the environment. Um, now, if we think about um, the current state uh, in terms of reliance or, or fu expected future reliance on on fossil fuels in the electric power industry. Um, you know, these, uh, this figure shows where uh, countries uh, in, in the world are, are planning on building uh, coal-fired power plants, right? Uh, even though the movement in the United States and Western Europe has been away from uh, coal as a, as a fuel in electric power plants, um, that is not consistent with what's been happening in China and India and other parts of Asia. Um, now, what we're essentially wanting to do is disrupt this traditional Kuznets curve. Um, and, you know, with the, within the context of, you know, the electric power industry, we really want utilities to not do what we did, right? We don't want them to follow this traditional path um, of, uh, economic development where they rely specifically on coal-fired power plants as a source of electricity generation. Um, so what we want them to do is develop economically uh, at some point and jump off this Kuznet curve and develop economically um, while simultaneously reducing pollution. Um, and so there are possibilities for, for how this could happen. And, and a lot of those possibilities um, are aligned with technological improvements, right? So low cost of renewable energy. Um, the low cost of renewable energy is something new that uh, these developing economies are experiencing that was not available uh, to the United States or Western Europe uh, when they were uh, industrializing. Uh, also a lack of legacy costs. We've talked a lot about the financial inertia 
of the electric power industry. Um, I used the phrase, the ship is turning when I showed that uh, picture of the people from the movie, movie Titanic. That's the phrase that the CEOs of, of electric power utilities, um, they use to describe how slow it is and how much time it takes to shift away from technologies that we've already invested in. Uh, and so if you are a developing economy, in some cases, you may be a little more nimble in terms of how you can invest in infrastructure. Um, and so the analogy that's often given is that some countries have skipped over landline communications and went directly to mobile. And so what we're hoping uh, is that because of a lack of legacy costs and fewer assets to strand, uh, countries may have more options for investing in renewable technologies um, instead of, and that may allow them to sort of jump off the Kuznets curve. Um, you know, in developed countries, and so we would put the U.S. in this category, or industrial and post-industrial countries, um, there is some evidence that reductions in fossil fuel use can happen in a way that doesn't devastate economies, right? So from uh, historical evidence over the last several years, uh, we've seen every region of the United States decrease uh, energy-related CO2 emissions, especially in the electric power sector. Now, from 2008 onward, um, a big chunk of that initially was due to the financial crisis when electricity demand um, uh, went down quite a bit. Um, but as we've talked about throughout the semester, right, uh, electricity uh, or emissions from the electric power sector in particular in the United States have declined because of lower than expected demand growth, but also the, the switch away from coal to natural gas uh, and increased penetration of renewables. Um, and then we're also seeing something similar happen um, in, in Europe as well. Uh, globally, what we see is that uh, emissions intensity uh, as a, as a um, function of uh, uh, GDP units, so kilograms of CO2 per dollars of GDP, um, is declining, right? Uh, and, as a, and partly as a result, um, uh, global CO2 emissions have somewhat leveled off. Um, or they're at least not increasing at the same rate they have since, uh, you know, since the, the, the early 2000s. Um, now, that picture on a global scale is a lot different depending on where you go, right? So the figure at the right shows um, CO2 emissions declining in the United States and declining in the European Union, um, while emissions are increasing in India and at least over the last decade or two have, have increased dramatically in China. Um, and so the picture is different depending on where you are. The question everywhere, uh, not just in countries like uh, China and India, but also uh, in the United States and Europe, is whether re future reductions in emissions can be both big enough to matter, to do something uh, meaningful about climate change, but also popular enough to happen. Are they politically going to be feasible? Because the reality is that if we look at the emissions that we've experienced, um, the emissions reductions that we've experienced in the United States and Europe, it's really a fraction of the reductions that are truly needed uh, to do something meaningful about climate change. So there, even though there's evidence that you know, the economy in the United States has been growing uh, while emissions have gone down, we're talking about emissions reductions that are kind of paltry compared to what's really needed um, to, to do something meaningful about climate change. So, um, you know, for simplicity, let's just consider the electric power industry. How could swift action on climate change impact people, consumers, voters, right? The people that ultimately kind of have a say about what happens uh, in this country. Um, and we talked about lots of different uh, ways that um, this could impact um, uh, the, the mechanics of the electric power industry, electricity markets, and prices for consumers. Um, you know, increased reliance on renewable energy just requires um, more redundancy, right? Both in terms of long-term planning and short-term operations. The intermittency and, and uncertainty associated with renewable energy uh, means that it's more costly to meet the same amount of electricity demand um, using the uh, a, a given amount of capacity, right? So utilities have to come up with some sort of ratio to downgrade the ability of renewables to help meet peak system demand. You can't rely on one megawatt of wind capacity the same way you can rely on one megawatt uh, 
of, for example, a natural gas combustion turbine. Uh, and so typically utilities will sort of downgrade the capacity value of renewable energy and they'll say something like, every one megawatt of wind capacity meets um, half a megawatt or 0.4 megawatts of peak system demand. Um, and so what that means is that we probably have to build extra generation capacity, batteries, and new transmission to make sure that we can meet demand while still relying on variable renewable energy. Um, carbon taxes and cap and trade programs uh, would make electricity from fossil fuel plants more expensive. So in the short run, before we retire those fossil fuel units, uh, this could increase wholesale electricity prices. We saw this both in one of your homework assignments and in a lecture about uh, carbon and renewable energy policy, right? So these are three different system supply curves for a simple electricity market with uh, blue representing no carbon tax, red representing a $20 per ton CO2 carbon tax, uh, and green representing a $40 per ton CO2 carbon tax. And so even if we have the exact same mix uh, of electricity generation and the same amount of demand, um, this creates three different distinct um, prices uh, for electricity in this wholesale market with the higher the carbon tax translating to uh, the higher the market price of electricity. We've also talked about um, the issue of asset stranding for electric utilities, right? So um, if power plants or, or electric utilities retire fossil fuel power plants early, that could lead to stranding. What that means is that um, those power plants may no longer be operational but still owe a lot of money, right? When, when utilities borrow a lot of money to build power plants, they essentially are, are taking out a loan and they have a mortgage payment that they have to pay off over you know, 25, 35 years. Uh, and so that remaining debt would still need to be paid back. Um, and a, a, a nice way to look at this, um, here if you look at the, the green line, what it shows is the remaining debt on a $500 million sort of hypothetical power plant. Uh, the utility is paying $32, $33 million every year back on its original loan. And so gradually that debt gets paid off. But if you're a, a power plant um, that's been around for 15 or 16 years, um, you know, so you're, you're about 60% through the lifetime of the power plant. So you might think that that's an okay time to retire at early, but the reality is you're only about 50% 50 50 of the way done paying your remaining debt. You still have $250 million left to pay on this coal plant. So if you retire these, these fossil fuel power plants early and then go build new renewable energy generation and additional infrastructure that's needed to facilitate meeting demand using intermittent renewable energy, you're going to be paying double. You're going to be paying off your mortgage on the fossil fuel power plants while you're also investing in new capacity. Uh, and then the last thing we really talked about is the sort of broader potential for um, a financial or economic downturn uh, due to what's called the carbon asset bubble. There have been a lot of financial institutions that have expressed concern over the potential for uh, a rapid market correction for carbon risk to set off a global financial crisis. I mean, we talked about what caused the 2008 financial crisis, and a big part of it was um, a lot of big financial institutions thinking that all the stuff they owned was worth this amount of money, and it turns out very quickly that they were um, sort of rudely awakened to the fact that it was really worth a lot less. And so um, if we collectively decide to leave 80% uh, of coal in the ground, 50% of natural gas in the ground, 33% of oil in the ground, a lot of the companies that own those reserves, uh, that own infrastructure that's related to the extraction, refining, delivery, and end use of fossil fuels, um, a lot of those firms are going to lose a lot of money, and the people that invest in those firms are going to lose a lot of money. And so there's a, uh, a concern that um, this could sort of cause a chain reaction that could create another uh, financial crisis. Um, and so the question we really have to ask ourselves is, does this mean we should be okay with more gradual change. Um, does this recommend sort of taking our foot off the gas pedal uh, in terms of uh, you know reducing CO2 emissions? Do we need to do that um, in a more prolonged way as opposed to making it an overnight change? Um, ultimately, this depends on what we think the costs are of doing nothing uh, or not enough uh, to mitigate climate change. Um, so let's assume 
uh, and I think everybody mostly agrees on this, uh, that the future cost of climate change, um, of, especially if we do nothing, are much, much greater than the near-term costs of mitigation, right? So even though it's costly to do something quickly about climate change, um, that cost that we would pay to mitigate the risks associated with future climate change are way less than the actual cost of going through catastrophic climate change, for example, in the year 2100. Um, even if this, even if we all know this, right, it's still a difficult choice. Um, and we've talked about why this is a difficult choice from sort of like a, an economic psychological standpoint. It has to do with the time value of money, right? Um, this is something that we covered in one of your readings uh, that was about the, the discount rates with otters, right? So the time value of money inherently means that revenues, but also costs, and we could say the costs of climate change, the damages associated with climate change that occur out in the future inherently matter less than the ones that come sooner. Uh, and so this discount rate and the value of this discount rate really matters in terms of how we balance uh, what we think is important now versus what we think is important out into the future. Uh, so in a more abstract rate, the discount rate, when we all have different discount rates, um, sort of indicates a willingness to act on climate change, right? Um, how much do we value the present versus how much do we value the future? How much are we willing to pay now to mitigate some of the harmful effects that are going to occur way out into the future that we individually may not even experience. It might be our children or our children's children that would experience the most harmful effects of climate change. So the, the discount rate really impacts the future costs we associate with, with climate change. When it comes to dealing with climate change, um, you know, depending on what your discount rate is, it influences how you view uh, those future costs. Um, and we can also think about individual, we can think about individual people having different discount rates. We can also think about different countries having uh, diff different discount rates, or uh, especially within the context of an environmental Kuznets curve. So who would have a high discount? Who would have a low discount? So in the context of an environmental Kuznets curve, we would really think about the pre-industrial economies as having a high discount rate. In other words, um, they're much more likely to discount future benefits or future costs relative to the present, right? Because you're starting out at a, at a low stage of economic development, right? You still have basic needs to meet as a society, uh, health, uh, education, uh, food security, Right. There are lots of things you need to worry about before you start worrying about what's going to happen to the environment uh, 100 years from now. Right. Uh, so we might think about post-industrial economies as having a lower discount rate where they're a little more ambivalent about um, what happens today versus what happens far out into the future. Um, it gets even more complicated when you talk about how mitigation and adaptation costs should be allocated across countries, especially given the context in which um, not every country contributes to climate change the same way, right? If this is a map showing annual CO2 emissions by country, it's a little bit older, it's 2014 data, but clearly there are some countries that are guilty of uh, emitting more CO2 than others, right? And so you would think that those countries would, have, would be responsible for, for bearing the brunt of the cost, not only uh, associated with mitigating emissions, but also uh, helping some of the poorer countries adapt to the uh, inevitable impacts of climate change. And this has been a, a great source of conflict and debate uh, in stringing together um, you know, global cooperative agreements about how to deal with country, uh, climate change. Even if we think about within the United States, um, let's say the United States decides to institute a carbon tax to reduce uh, CO2 emissions across the board, not just from the energy industry, but uh, from other sectors of the economy as well. We have to be very careful uh, about how we implement a carbon tax uh, in, um, in order to avoid unintended uh, consequences, especially um, on more marginalized and more vulnerable segments of the population. We've seen this figure before. What it shows is that a carbon tax, if it's implemented in a less responsible way, could be regressive, which means that it disproportionately would impact poor people. 
uh, you know, there are different ways to implement this carbon, a carbon tax in order to sort of redistribute um, the income that would be generated or the revenue that would be generated from uh, by the federal government from a carbon tax uh, and to redistribute that to people um, uh, that are uh, the neediest uh, in order to protect them from this necessary policy action. Uh, but it's not a given that that will happen. So we really need to keep this in mind when we're thinking about uh, what to do about climate change. Um, you know, how we um, go about that in a way that protects the most vulnerable segments of our society, both in the United States and globally, um, may go a long way in determining whether those policies are successful and are supported um, in, in a popular sense by, by voters. Um, but I think the the overarching message of what we're, we're seeing in the early days, right, um, of, of trying to do something about climate change um, is that there will be pushback. There was not going to be universal agreement that we need to do this. And that just um, has to do with the, the very real costs that are associated with uh, mitigating uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the short term, even if those costs are smaller uh, than the eventual harm that would be caused by climate change. Um, you know, people's, uh, the import importance people place on their standard of living today uh, mean that there will be people that do not want to do this, uh, that do not, are unwilling to, uh, to, to sacrifice uh, something today in order to mitigate uh, the potential future costs in the future. Um, and this should inform very much the way we think about uh, solving the climate challenge and, and communicating um, about climate change and the benefits of renewable energy and the risks associated with doing nothing, but also the risks associated with doing something. So um, that's it um, for discussion questions. Um, you know, what do we do? Uh, what should the key elements of a transition to carbon sustainability from an environmental, uh, social, and economic standpoint be? Um, what's a worse mistake to make? Do, is, is acting too slowly or acting too quickly a worse mistake to, to make? Um, how do you think these issues uh, should be handled in political discourse? Does this change uh, how you see your role in this issue? Um, what do you think is going to happen? Um, it's a it's a really open question. It's an interesting time to be alive. Um, it's a really hard challenge to solve um, uh, in a lot of different respects, and uh, a lot of brain power is going to be required to to help solve it. So, um, anyway, thanks for taking the course. Uh, the final exam is going to be comprehensive. It's going to cover lectures and readings. It's going to be all short answer, no math, no quantitative questions at all. Uh, and we can talk more about this um, through email. Uh, just email me if you have any questions. So uh, congratulations on fin finishing the end of the lectures. And thanks again for taking the class.